Hello, friends. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and envies, back to the Watery Death Show podcast. This is Stream of Thought for the summer 2021 anime season. I hope I pronounced that correctly. The <laughs> summer season. The season. Uh, it's always anime season here, though. Um, I hope y'all are doing well today. Um, I am the subtle doctor. Still am the subtle doctor. That hasn't changed. Uh, You (laughs) could tell that we've been on a bit of a break. A couple weeks off. Uh, Maybe a little bit of ring rust, but hopefully we'll work that off as we go. I am joined by my ever-present co-host, the chromiest dome, (laughs) the manliest mancunian, the guiltiest gear. Shadon, the hardest working man in pod business as well. Welcome back, Shadon. Thanks, Doc. Um, I'm just going to say now that for today you may call me the Raging Radish because I am very beetroot oh. or radish colored red. This is because of sunburn and in case you're wondering why I am sunburned, there is there's a long and complicated story behind this. It's really nuanced. There are many, many layers to it, things to take away. But I feel like I can give you the distilled... Um, you know, cliff note summary of I'm a moron. So there you are. <laughs> um, so yeah, currently working through the weird hangover adjacent brain fog of having horrible sunburn on my head, which given that I am as bald as the day I was born, if not balder, uh, is not entirely pleasant. Um, but that being said, I'm looking forward to talking about Sunny Boy. Um, I am looking forward to trying to untangle uh, the web that is woven through this show's first three episodes and make some sense of it and offer some thoughts. Um, because, yeah, this this show is uh, it's intriguing, certainly. It's a puzzle I am re- very ready that to... That is... <laughs> very ready to uh, try and uh, solve. I feel like that's such a good word to encapsulate my feelings about it. Like, this show fascinates me. Uh, and I am very intrigued by it. It, it is now. the quintessential beard stroking anime. <laughs> for, for, for the, it really is. For, for the people at home. <laughs> you must wear a beret to watch a pr- uh, correctly. Just there smoking a pipe, considering it. <laughs> exactly. Like, so... <laughs> before we get into it, though, because and, and just know that I... I have very little in the way of, like certainty about the show Mm -hmm. and like really um anything more than very basic (laughs) cursory takes i feel i feel like my takes are not up to snuff we'll see i'll think about it of course as we go along um but before we get into talking about the show proper uh i just want to quickly say that if you enjoy uh our work or you want to uh, get the latest about what's going on at Water We Death Show. You can follow the pod at Water We Death Show. You can follow me at The Subtle Doctor and Shadon at Shadon1010, all on Twitter. Um, and you could subscribe to us over at our Patreon. That's the, the most bestest way to support the show, if you can. Of course, no obligation to do that. It's over at patreon.com slash Water We Death Show. Um, of course, all this is very Googleable. I think we... We cornered the market on on this name for podcasting. Um, you know, so if you're interested in, you know, it's also yeah. Googleable. Uh, how not to get sunburned? But I didn't do that. Don't make my mistake. You use that. Google no. to its fullest abilities and look us up through there. Oh, what is it? You didn't use the Net Googles. Is that what it's called in the show? The the off brand search engine. I, I, Net Google. I use I use Google. Um, it's the fake Google. It just doesn't give you anything useful. It's like the I'm lucky function. <laughs> I'm feeling lucky function on Google, except it's disguised as a genuine search engine. So you type in Alan's get sunburn, it tells you things like, you know, how many people eat cheese per capita in Germany or some shit like that. <laughs> there needs to be a Tumblr that chronicles fake social media apps in anime. Like, not just like totally original ones, but like knockoffs, such as Net Googles or Google. I feel like that was one maybe in Sarazan Mai. There was like there's there's so many. I we need we need 
something, some kind of collection of screenshots that will allow us to search and and have some kind of database. This is important information. We need to Google the fake Googles, basically. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, I mean that, all, that all sounds very impressive, but if there's one thing that Sunny Boy has shown me, it, it is that there is someone out there with the skill to create a QR code using only chalk and a board, which was <laughs> mighty impressive. Dude. Okay. Why is the show called Sunny Boy? Do we know? Does um, anyone know at this point? Is it is it because the person who wrote the show or created the show is a huge fan of Foghorn Leghorn? I don't know. As far as I good, say, I say, I say, an uh, anime, Sunny <laughs> Boy. I, I, I wish I knew. It, it, it sounds like the refrain of like some really cantankerous like cowboy in a spaghetti western, like a side character. Your guess is good as mine. I'm sure we'll find out. Like everything else in the Maybe. show, I'm sure we'll find out. That's going to be something I'm going to repeat often throughout this podcast. Um, feel free to drink your favorite <laughs> alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverage every time I say it. Probably the latter is more preferable because I'm going to say it so many times, you will be plastered by the end of it. We'll figure out later. It'll all make sense, I hope. I feel like we're going to be just... This pod is going to be us scratching in the dirt. No, I, I, have, I, I have, I have, I have ideas. I, I have, I have, I have ideas and thoughts and analyses to give, um, and bad jokes. So, you know, perfect. I'm, I, I might have like deep fried my brain. You know, like it might have poached like an egg, but it still functions a little bit. You know, make it work. The essential parts, the essential parts work. Like the pun making center of your brain is still functional. Oh, that's 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 deep down in the protected area but mm-hmm. yeah exactly he's at the core of the of the of the web mm. in there um gogo atomic robot says uh that they think it's a code name for an experiment uh that sent the kids to this island i think that's as, as good a guess as any i can come up with that quite for sure. quite possibly to which i will only say I hope whoever initiated uh, Project Sunny Boy has a very, very <laughs> deep Texan accent. Operation Sunny Boy is go. Repeat, Operation Sunny Boy is go. Push, push that <laughs> such a weird... What's like the link? Like, how does that... We well, you know what? Never mind. Never mind. I feel like... No, let's not do this. <laughs> so, uh, bef- okay. Um, so, uh, back of box, Shadon. Um... Summarize your feelings about the show. Uh, well, I think the first thing I could say is that I'm not going to pretend the show isn't obtuse. It comes in with no like pretenses or excuses or concessions, really, to the audience. But I think that's actually fine. Not all shows need to be necessarily like readily accessible. Um, so I'm okay with that. And beyond that, I'll just say this. I do think it has actually a really, really interesting subversion of its core premise, which is people teleported to or taken to or spirited away to another place without usual access to, like, resources or normal society or civilization. Mm -hmm. Because there's been tons of stories like that before. I mean, they actually outright reference Treasure Island, which, while not, from my memory, is a marooned on an island story. It's just more about finding said island of treasure and all that um there are of course adjacent stories to that lord of the flies is the one that immediately springs to mind you know there's there's tons of them out there right um and they generally speaking trend towards the same kind of uh, outcome but sunny boy actually seems to have a different take on this which i will get to when we get to talking points i find rather fascinating uh and actually kind of subversive Mm. Um, which Mm. could be interesting, although it might also just be a case of me with my sunburned baked brain reading way too much into things as usual. But, you know, um, beyond that, um, yeah, it's off to a okay start. I wouldn't blame people if they watched the first three episodes and they're like, "Mm, whatever. But at the same time, I appreciate that it's not trying to be it. something. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm strange and odd and obtuse as fuck and maybe a little bit impenetrable. Do I care? No, not really. So, yeah, I mean, I I totally agree with you about uh, basically all that. Like, it is an arty, kind of uh, weird anime. It's obtuse is a great word, you know, kind of opaque about, you know, 
what it's trying to do and certain mechanics. There's a lot of weird imagery. Many things happen that are unexplained. Tons of non sequiturs. Uh, but like, like you were saying, not only so I'll go that further. Not only is that okay, but I actually really enjoy that. I I like when mm. really odd story full of strange imagery can kind of pull me along. It doesn't really need to like explain every little thing. Like I, I get the sense, you know, at this point in the show that if like we're expecting, you know, like a catalog of like, well, these things are this and these, you know, blue and green, you know, electronic doggies, like they represent this thing and that. So that's, I feel like not going to happen, mm-hmm. but that's okay. Yeah. Um, I, am enjoying this show just kind of at the level of, you know, I, I like the pretty pictures, uh-huh. uh, like, you know, pull, pull me along, you know, I'm, I'm here for your roller coaster ride of like weird shit. Um, I I'll take that. And you know, your Lord of the flies comparisons are apt. Definitely. I mean, that's like the, or one of these stories. Mm-hmm. One of the interesting differences I think is like that there's not resource scarcity. Mm. So, you know, it kind of, the, the impetus for conflict in the group is different um, than just like, well, there's not enough meat or, you know, there's not water or whatever. Um, it's sort of almost like, uh, did you ever, did you ever take a, a, like a political theory course uh, um, in university or? Yeah, I got, I got mine from the University of Reddit. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Okay. No, I did, I did, I did not. Good. I did not. Um, at least, at least you didn't enroll in the Prager U1. Yeah. That's, I, you know, uh, yeah. that bullet. I, I graduated magna cum laude, but I think that might have been from a different course on Reddit entirely. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, there's like, uh, a lot of like early modern political theory, uh, like, you know, post-Renaissance, uh, through like, well, the 19th century or so was really into this idea, like in political theory called like the state of nature. You know, people like Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau would talk a lot about like if you scaled society back or just imagine society like at like its origins, like when it was disparate people coming together to kind of make something, um, what would that look like and why would it be that way and all kinds of it reminds me a little bit of that, you know, because it's not, of course, exactly the same thing, but they are kind of their own political entity their own uh state i guess uh not maybe that's too loaded of a term but they're their own little society and they're having to figure out like ways of uh of existing together you know uh how uh how uh, sort of strict are the rules and how collaborative is it all that stuff and so all that stuff, I don't want to get too, too deep into it because we're only on back of box section, but I really like all that stuff. And I think that's some really interesting thought experiments mm-hmm. going Indeed. on. You, um, you're touching on uh, what I'll be talking about later as a matter of fact. So yeah, there is, I think that this is not, I would say, um, certainly about the characters. I mean, there are, the this particular episode two thus far is certainly about a character. But I wouldn't. Right. I would not call it character focused in, say, the way that Dino Xenon was. Um, and I wouldn't even necessarily call Dino Xenon an ultra character focused show, but rather as a ensemble cast. But they were very distinct people. I sometimes keep forgetting the names of these characters and just you know not barely telling. Oh them man! But this is totally. But this, I would say, is more of a conceptual show. Like we're going to put characters in situations, and we're going to make like examinations of the situation that they're in and maybe draw some meanings and inferences. I mean, if, ultimately, I suppose, if you want a shorter, too long, didn't read, single sentence uh, summary from me, it's like the Shugenics arc in Guilty Crown, except not shit. <laughs> the Shugenics arc. Which, just, just to refresh God. your memory, is when the kids in the high school uh, are all, like, trapped there, uh, separated from adults, they get ranked on their powers. So again, I'm literally not even kidding when I say it's a yeah. lot like that. Um, and, you know, there's this whole conflict over various things, except, I mean, saying Guilty Crown is stupid. It feels like, you know, stating that, you know, <laughs> the air has oxygen in it or the sky sure. is blue. Um, so no surprise is that that idea, which had potential, was just utterly excruciating. 
It was like having a bowel movement watching that. But this is substantially better um, already. So I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm on board with. It. I mean, that just goes to show again. Like I often say, like it's rare you'll find me think of a, that like an out a concept for a show is out and out bad. But usually, it's the execution mm-hmm. that is either lacking or, well, something that should get the creators put on a watch list. <laughs> sure. Uh, speaking of creators, uh, we're we're going to talk about the the main man behind the show uh in just a minute but uh, quickly i just want to say that if the show like the concept of anime lord of the flies intrigues you but you want something uh, even science fiction anime lord of the flies intrigues you but you want something more straightforward that's less uh you know conceptual and uh you know dealing in like weird imagery and is is more uh i guess grounded for lack of a better word as grounded as a you know science fiction lord of the flies type thing can be uh i would recommend watching an anime called infinite revius uh, r y v i u s or mugen no revius uh it um i i liked it a lot it's like a like i think it's like a early 2000s anime so the visuals may not hold up the best but like i think the writing is still pretty good and yeah it's just uh more anime lord of the flies except on a like a derelict spaceship uh instead of you know uh instead of whatever the setting for this (laughs) for this is the multiple universes or whatever (laughs) that's happening here um okay so uh i did say we're gonna do creators but actually actually uh no no no, let's do creators now and then we'll do the summary after that um so the person i want to to talk about uh is the director whoa what happened there (laughs) the director and the writer uh, i mean if if we want to go into a musical why not now's a good time as any (laughs) this is a weird second puberty happening here um uh uh the, the director the script writer and uh, storyboarder of the first two episodes, not every episode so far, um, but of the show um, is Shingo Natsume. Um, this is a madhouse show as well. Um, that's the studio that I, he doesn't just work out of that, but I think like his probably his most famous stuff has come from there. Um, so Shingo Natsume, born in 1980. And he's originally from JC staff, but he worked at Gonzo and uh, Shin Doga and became a freelancer later. Um, he's regarded as one of the promising talents of the industry. And he first gained attention for doing animation on Welcome to the NHK at Gonzo uh, after only being in the anime business for, for four years. Um, one as a in between or three as a key animator mm-hmm. um and so and this is a big thing about him is like he's a director now and i probably know for that but like he's a very talented animator um so he also has worked on like gurren lagan in key animation um and that caught hiroyuki uh imaishi's eye um, and he has directed like episodes of the Tatami Galaxy and uh, Umi Monogatari. Um, that's where he kind of got his like, he's like, mm, this directing thing. I kind of like this. <laughs> uh, and, he, and then he became the unit director for uh, the Full Metal Alchemist movie, Sacred Star of Milos. And then, uh, do you remember the uh, the little show called uh, Horimiya? Uh, um, no. That we just that we just <laughs> you forgot about Horimiya already. Well, it's a love story about. Uh, no, so there was an OVA for that show that came out a while ago, before the, the TV oh, show. Oh yeah, that's and right, that's right. Is one of uh, you know Natsume's like early things that he was the head director on, but he really kind of broke out uh on uh space dandy directing episodes of that um he also helped out with the show running of that and he had some like general direction responsibilities in it you know 
that's a most people think about Shinichiro Watanabe when they think of that show, but Natsume was also the showrunner for part of it. And his main claim to fame, thing that you guys probably know him for, is Welcome to the Spaceship. No, I'm kidding. It's it's um uh, the first season of One Punch Man. Uh, he directed that, uh, and as we all know, that is really amazing and fantastic. And I think part of that can be attributed, according to what I've read, uh, to all the connections Natsume has made over the years in the industry. He was able to bring in a lot of really talented people uh, to make that show a success. And now here he is. He's been given basically carte blanche by Madhouse to kind of do whatever he wants to do with this anime original thing, Sunny Boy. Uh, and like I said, he's... He's writing the scripts, he's doing a ton of the storyboarding, and he's the showrunner. So there we go. This is uh, this is his baby, and uh, it, it, this is one of the the few shows that I can remember uh, in recent memory uh, where we could just be like the success or failure point to one person. <laughs> like obviously, this is a collaborative <laughs> project, and there are a ton of other people animating it, uh, doing storyboarding. There's the seiyu, all you know, all the different like component parts, but like not so many really seems to have like the steering wheel. I mean, this. there's, there's also Amazon choosing not to sue for like, you know, <laughs> having, uh, but it's basically their logo and their name uh, in this at various points. Um, and I love that it, I love that it wasn't just a stupid, like, uh, this is our, our Amazon, but it was like related. It was like a superpower. One of the characters. Had. Yeah. Like she has, she could just use Amazon whenever to an extra dimensional Amazon. Very strange superpower now. I mean, I, I, you know, that's that's prime plus that. You what can I say? Just haven't released out to the wild yet. <laughs> I, I'll just add, by the way, on the creative front. I know this is not normally something that I um, talk about when it, um, or at least I don't usually get involved in the creative because it's not usually something I'm familiar with. But I, I had the strangest sense watching this. I was like, where have I seen this animation style before? Where have I seen this, like, the way these characters design, the way they look, how they are drawn? Mm. And I, and it clicks with me. It's a show that I was actually very harsh on, relatively speaking, when it came out. Um, but my opinion softened on it a little bit since then, if only because I probably wasn't approaching it on its own terms, which, if, funnily enough, is also how Elfin you should... Ta- no, <laughs> get out. No. Um, which is also funny of how you should approach Sunny Boy, I would argue, which is just to come on its own terms. That show is one that Madhouse also did, if I recall correctly, and it's Aka oh, 13. Aka, yeah, he, so he directed that as well. Yeah, and the, uh, the, I, I forgot to the, say. the character yeah. designs look... Well, well, obviously, like, the outfits and such are not the same, given the dif- disparate settings. The general style and sensibility of Sunny Boy reminds me a lot of that. Like, it actually pops up in my brain. I was like, oh, that's that's neat. Especially some of the more pastel looks to certain um, settings. Like, a lot of this feels very painterly. Like, it's a very unique-looking show beyond the strange visuals. Like, I, I like that a lot. Um, so I will definitely give the show credit and nothing else for standing out on how it looks. And I think that it's like I've said before about other shows... Um, having a distinct animation style, even if it's one that seems relatively simplistic, like is in this case, can accentuate like a dreamlike or otherworldly state. Yeah. And that definitely is the case here. So I think it works really well. I wish I could borrow my wife's art brain for a moment because there's a word to describe what's happening, you know, especially with things like, um, like whenever, uh, Oh man! I said Asakase, the the kid with like the most Marvel superpowers. You can oh. fly around and use electricity. Whenever he lands in the water in the second episode and it parts, like the way the water looks is incredible. Like I thought, I was like, is the word mosaic? And that's not quite right, but it's it's a kind of a, a it's a, some kind of classic like a style that I can't cause it's not impressionist. It's not a mosaic. It's not like a particularly abstract, although I guess you could call it that. But anyway, yeah, there's a lot of really cool touches, uh, mm-hmm. artistically. I mean, when, uh, that the, well, that like you said that contribute to like the dreamlike nature of the, of the world and reinforce like the, the setting, like, yeah. uh, whenever, uh, that same kid was like, I don't know, 
warping reality in the first episode. Like, oh, you mean when he the, the you, screen looked like cracked glass? You mean when he was conjuring the uh, Persona Five Victory screen? Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Oh, the, the Devil May Cry Victory screen. You... About to go to Tartarus. Now. Oh, Jesus. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just still waiting for the melting clocks to turn up myself, but. Beyond that, like the show looks really good. I can't, I can't hold it against uh, that against them. Like I say, Madhouse is a pretty good pedigree studio in terms of mm-hmm. their app. I can't speak for their actual creative practices or working conditions. I'm not really all that familiar, but I mean, they seem to have been relatively quiet lately, as opposed to all the other studios I could mention, mm-hmm. including of all people, Science Saru, who recently had put their foot in it. Oh no, I didn't hear about this. They, we'll, they, we'll they, talk about this off the air. Oh, uh, yeah, because... no, we'll not, we'll not, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll not sidetrack yeah, it. I'll, I'll look it up. That's sad. that's sad. well. T- t- you know, Madhouse is, doesn't have a particular, doesn't have a clean record on this. I mean, no one's that I can recall anyway. Like, you know, died at their desk or anything. But like, mm-hmm. I think that they've underpaid people for a while. I don't think they have a lot of money. Um, so, uh, so that, that has happened. <laughs> I want to say they might've even filed for bankruptcy before. Uh, but, but that could be, I could be thinking of the wrong studio. Anyway, anime industry is broken. Um, mm-hmm. and speaking of broken things, oh boy. Shadon, are you ready to summarize <sighs> the first episodes of this anime? Doing this in two minutes. I mean, I've actually, my track record for summarizing thus far has actually been pretty solid. I reckon I can give this a pretty good go. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe I'll get a prize. Maybe yeah. I'll get a sticker um, if I manage to do it under two minutes. But yes, <laughs> I'll, bring I'll it send up. you on over Discord. <laughs> I'll send you a sticker. Okay. okay. We're, we're going to go in. Uh, and by the way, if you're joining us for the first time, we're giving Shadon two minutes. Two minutes on the clock to summarize these first three episodes just in case you're watching this a year from now and you have no idea what happened you don't remember here we go shadon five four three two one okay so a bunch of kids are transported to some sort of otherworldly like hell dimension where everything's black and empty and featureless just like country music you know it's just there's nothing there it's just a void <laughs> no nothing there not a thing um <laughs> and swiping country out of the and room. so oh they're like various kids start like falling into a rules based system where it turns out a lot of them have superpowers as well that are also inexplicably there um but yeah things are surprisingly not as anarchic as you might think like people still falling in line one girl wants to do exams and all that uh the two lead characters whose names i recall are from um, god what was it again nozomi, nozomi and nagara uh-huh. like uh they yeah. like after various points in which it turns out the rules based system can break down um Nozomi actually turns out has the power to break out of this world into a new one, which leads them onto an island. Um, and that's basically episode one, very abridged there. Episode two, they're on the island and things keep staying on fire spontaneously. Um, like, we've either got an arsonist or just some strange spontaneous combustion shit going on. Um, but there's another character named Nozomi, who is the uh, Amazon uh, Prime user that we mentioned before, able to get free stuff. They believe it's her at fault because all her stuff keeps staying on fire. Um, but eventually they find out after actually talking to her and doing a little bit of investigation that you have to exchange things. Like you have to pay for stuff basically in this world else the stuff sets on fire. And so there's a reconciliation in the end between the characters and, um, and they have like a new economy set up with like this kid inventing his own NFTs or whatever it is. I don't know, his own crypto. Um, <laughs> episode three, kids are disappearing and turning into like black statues. Um, uh, Nozomi and Nagara now team up and actually start like discussing like things like capitalism, like coming back in and all this while investigating their absences. They find out all of them are recluses, but they're not really. They just kind of got disappeared by the rules of this new world that they're in, this next layer um, where if they are ignored by uh, the people, um, around them, then they seconds. disappear, and it turns out also that Janus Joestar might be evil. There you go. Okay, <laughs> that's it. I think I, I, I think time. I think I did reasonably well there. I give myself a six yeah. out of ten on that one. Um, <laughs> fair enough. You did better than I would have done. I shit ha- shit happens. I don't know where to go. Yeah, this is like stuff occurs. Just. Blah. <laughs> things are happening it's like it's but, like it's like watching the cube after having a concussion <laughs> it is that's that's very apt um okay so i think 
maybe the stuff that we didn't by the way i sent you the page of names just to reference because i definitely need it also. I, I don't i don't care what um, the star kid is called they're janus joe star to me that's it wait a minute oh you mean the little star yeah birthmark they're, or they're, whatever? They're, oh, a joe, they're a joe star i don't care like what their actual name is janus joe star that's their name to me but he's but he's the bad guy are the Joe Star? The Joe Stars are good guys. Uh, well, one of them. Uh, well, Dio has you know Joe's body on it. Oh, sorry, Jonathan's body. Oh yeah, that's right. I yeah. guess that complicates things. Life is never simple, Shadon. No, it, it really it um, really isn't. <laughs> so uh, I guess now it would be a good time that we that we've talked about Matsume and uh, had our little refresher on um, the summary. If we're gonna go straight to the patron questions and then uh head up our own discussion points that we don't discuss in answering the patrons questions so let me pull the questions up so i have them in front of me uh okay i've got them shadon uh will you do the honors of reading the questions with pleasure so first batch of two comes from uh, johnny rackham uh, first of which goes based on the characters with powers we've gotten to know best thus far what correlations if any do you see between the characters and the powers they gained for instance, are they random, or is there any rational or symbolic links? Um, my immediate answer to this is I actually don't think that this is a, like the way that this show is structured with terms of like these characters having their powers is that they have like they have powers because of their past behavior, but rather it's now influencing their more current ones. I would say, um, in part because we just don't know a lot about them. I, I would argue. Um, mm. But also, I think that's probably more the intent of the show, which is that it's more expressly interested in the effects rather than the cause of, like, their powers. I mean, there is certainly an investigation element that's happening in this show. Um, <clears throat> but also, some of them are just rather random. I mean, there's literally a kid who has the E.T. power. <laughs> so dumb. Yeah, he, he, has a fi- he, has a, he has a finger that lights up. So... <laughs> Yeah, it literally is the ET why, power. Why does he have that power? Which actually might be, what? which actually might turn out to be more useful than you'd think if he also develops its like sequel, which is the ability to phone home, given their current situation. <laughs> if only the school didn't have infinite power uh, and infinite water, he'd be useful. <laughs> yeah, but no, he, he's got a light up finger. Congratulations. So I don't think that, as far as we've got so far, that the characters' like backstories and histories thus far like have led to them getting their powers the way they they have i think rather it's more a case of here's some random stuff um well not so random Hmm. i would say because i think some of them have expressly got the powers they have also in turn to because like uh, for example god why have i i'm i have i had a name on my notes i'm gonna look it up again uh nozomi that was it It was on tip of my tongue like she seems like a rebellious sort already and it is indeed her act of rebellion that breaks them out of the first layer um but of course mm-hmm. having being rebellious and having the ability to do anything with that is a, are two different things of course yeah that's i don't know if that's her rebellious nature is necessarily like her power she says is compass so she's the only one who can see the path home like the true way home you sort of see it like twinkling far off in the sky and everyone's just like are you sure you can she's like yes i can see it uh i mean maybe true. i guess i mean there are ways you could connect it to her uh, her being like an off the beaten path person or whatever yeah, yeah. i don't know the the only know. the only thing i'll note as well um with respect to the powers and who they go to is that um mizuo like part of what happens in episode two of her is her discussing with the assemblyman's daughter whose name i can't recall but you she's the assemblyman's daughter that's her function that's what defines her in the episode so it's fine um about privilege you're talking about pony yeah she she's the, ta- the president or whatever yeah she she's talking about like priv- people who have privilege and all that, and she suddenly, ironically, gained a lot like all of that through the fact that she has essentially access to unlimited Amazon parcels. She can get whatever she wants delivered. She lives in a castle, you know. She's, yeah, she's she, she's good. Mm-hmm. She's all set. So there is yeah, there is a um you know a, like a, a contrast and an irony to that that she has spoke like she criticizes like her privilege as being a diet member's daughter but in turn has the ability to basically give people whatever they want um i did mention before in the summary about the whole fact that you know there needs to be an exchange in order to stop the stuff from staying on fire but there is a get out clause on that in that if the person in question just says now nah, it's yours for free then as you'd expect 
that it's absolutely right fine. if there's like a yeah if there's like a willing it's almost like if the person who's giving it gives it with like a willing spirit of yep. giving uh then because there was a bunch of shit that uh what's his face the the laboratory man uh rajdani uh got from her but he says he got it free of charge he didn't imply that he stole it or whatever that you know what i mean it's like she gave it to him but i guess there wasn't that extra like feeling on her part oh. you know what i mean oh potentially it could be that because her mood soured towards the other kids over time so how they were treating her it was kind of a downward spiral where like oh you slan- sure. you slandered me and like that and i gave you my stuff and now i hate you and then suddenly that goodwill evaporates so maybe it's not a one and done thing but do you remember when he gave nozomi the the mario 3 raccoon leaf block yes like he gave it to her it didn't really seem like he wanted anything in return, but it also caught on blue fire. It wasn't explicit, I suppose, like the, um, or maybe he was deliberately, yeah. or maybe because he was hypothesizing experiments, he was, I see. Yeah. Yeah. He really didn't I, really want to give it yeah. to her. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to give you the tanuki suit and all that and nearly set you on fire, but it's all in the name <laughs> of science and exploration and progress. I assure you. Um, like, yes, I, I I think overall, like arguments could be mm-hmm. made for saying that there are like little things here and there that link the characters' mm-hmm. per- like personalities as we understand them at the moment to uh, the powers they gave, but I wouldn't call it like significant. I think again, what's more, the show is more interested in is the effects and what they do with them after the facts. That's more important. Right, right. It, at the very least, it seems like less than legible, like any um, kind of links. Because, and I thought. I thought the easiest one to talk about might be Cap, but like it seems like the only sort of like power that we saw him exhibit in the first iteration of this world uh, when they're just in the school. It seems like that was more a function of the world than him. It was because he he couldn't do it to um, Asakaze. It turned in uh, on, it turned in on himself in the end. <laughs> he's, yeah, he, yeah. He, yeah. He suffered the penalty to you know get out his cap yes. and show it to everyone. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yes, yes, good. Oh, but that yeah. that in itself, well, that in itself, which will be part of something I'll talk about later, is also about the idea of how rules and power are ephemeral, and they can just as easily disappear from underneath you without even realizing, and even turn back on you. Um, it's a lesson about structures and social standing and all. I that. know, and yeah. and yeah. and how we obey the rule of law and all that in the you know totally. like. Just because laws are written down doesn't mean people obey them. And there is, I don't even know how you describe it. Like, I think it is literally just the rule of law, like and how committed people are to it as a force, mm-hmm. you know? And then eventually they yeah. weren't, they didn't believe in it anymore. So um, hence, yeah, Coach's power, or Cap's power rather, uh-huh. turned in on itself. Yeah, the show's very political in this way, right? I mean, well, it has, they... the, cap- it has the capitalism word in it, you know? And it, it's true, and it's, it's not, true. and it's not appearing on a book written you know, on the front of a book written by K. Marx. So that clearly, it's I know. A... <laughs> yeah. Well, and by that, I don't necessarily even mean it's like woke or whatever, but it's just interested. Oh, in, I, I would even it, use. It seems to be interested in political ideas, like classic ones, you know, mm. about power and coercion and the rule of law, like you said, and the state's function and uh-huh. you know, collaborative societies versus like top down, like you know ruling like uh, other you know uh labor theory of value like economy like all that stuff is like just emerges from nothing in this world and Mm -hmm. you know this is the advantage of a thought experiment like this because you can see like it's really easy to like trace the roots of things like that to like like why did the economy come about well in this world for this reason and this reason and this reason okay is there any? Is there are there conclusions we can draw from that? You know, I think that stuff is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, do you have anything else to add that question, Doc? Or should we uh, move on to the next? Oh one? yeah, no. Um, that's right. I forgot we were answering a Patreon question. Um, I think I don't want to say that they're random, right? I don't want to like because that seems like a bridge too far. At this point, it's but I don't also I feel like there's no conclusion that I could draw from it. I mean, 
because for a while I thought, I thought, okay, there are definitely personality. Like these are like manifestations of something going on in their life because, you know, I don't know. I was, I guess I was thinking that Mizuho was like rich, uh, you know, and that's why she like appeared in the magic kingdom and that's why she has cats that can bring her anything. But I don't really know if that's true. You know, you brought up an interesting point about her kind of complaining to Pony about using, uh, you know, clout of the privileged class using their clout to get what they wanted. That would seem very hypocritical of her, but but she's also kind of a hypocritical character. So it's not out of the bounds of possibility, you know, because she's always like getting really mad at Nagara for running away from his problems when it seems like that she, she likes to do that as well as evidence in episode two, uh, Mm -hmm. rather than face up to everyone, uh, and tell them to fuck off. You know, she would just rather avoid, uh, avoid going through the hassle. So I don't know. I, it's hard to say Rackham. I think it's hard to find hard evidence uh, to go any sort of way. Maybe there's writing out there that has come up with a good theory of this, but I just haven't read it yet. Yeah, I, th- I think ultimately though, like whether or not, um, like there is a cr- cl- link to that or not. If if there is, then the show needs to probably start delving a bit more into backstory because again, this is why I was talking about cause versus effect here. Um, right. Because if it makes explicit that their personalities are linked out in that some way, then we're probably gonna need more scenes of like like what happened with. Um, <clears throat> Again, sunburn brain not working. Mizuo, <laughs> okay. thank you, Mizuo. Like, yeah. uh, with how like you know she interacted with the teacher who then disappeared. Um, you know, like that little more time right, like that. Yeah. I think is going is to be necessary to justify having that link in there. Because as I think part of also the appeal of of this kind of concepts is like they're a bunch of everybody's basically. There's you know the student council president, all the other various people, you know, all the randos. We've got the 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 cap, you know. We've got like the the nondescript like male protagonist who seems ultra generic, but that's fine in this context because he is an everyman, you know. Like we've got all these various kids who are just fairly plain and ordinary, and they have uh, like l- been plucked out of like our reality and into this other worldly dimension where nothing makes a lick of sense and taking these like fairly ordinary people and scattering them to the winds in this kind of environment is a challenge for them and that's the basis of those stories i mentioned before like law of the flies or even if i was to bring up a more well i won't call it an anime comparison but a video game comparison of course like even the the horrifying angelic howl part from uh fruits of grisaia which i know you i was talking to oh. ages ago uh, and it's oh. But that's a similar idea in that it's a bunch of like fairly ordinary people thrown into a yeah. terrible situation and how they react to it. And so mm-hmm. I think in some way having more specificity about their backstory, like who these people are, actually could make the show less interesting as a result. Because I think that it, you can find some appeal there in that it could happen to anyone. And how do mm. these like various like people like react to this? Like I'll get into it in my talking point later, but one thing I also want to mention is that in some way, like, you know, when they got plucked into this other world, all of the existing structures that they had really don't apply anymore. You know? Yep. The government isn't mm-hmm. there anymore, for example, if you want to pick one thing out from there. Um, time doesn't... Even, like, you know, they don't even seem like, you know, things happening, like, because time keeps looping in a sense that they, of course, progress in a linear fashion, but what's happening in the real mm. world, like, keeps resetting by a day. So it's Groundhog Day in terms of like what they see on their phones as far as like the news is concerned. Um, and do these structures even apply anymore? Like the student council president isn't voted in to be the person leading the group, even though one would argue, and indeed the show, the characters in the show make this argument, that would seem to be the most sensible thing in the, in the Japanese school system from to do if they were in a situation like this, bizarre as it sounds, which is we already have an established voted leader, let them do it. But it turns out, no, the answer is no, that's not the case. But does this being yeah. a council president count for anything now? You know, does that even matter in now that this basically like factory reset has happened in a sense? Yeah. Um, and I'm going to go into that in more detail there because that's where I think mm-hmm. this show is actually kind of brilliantly subversive uh, as far as its core concept goes. Um, but that's also why I'm arguing in the end that I don't think their backstory should be delved in too deeply because I think yeah. having it be 
war everyman like who do have like these couple of attributes and define roles uh, i think that works then in theory you could try and say hey if they're in take the same group of characters and put them in a different scenario and see how they play out differently what i think is the show's characters for lack of a better phrase is actually more the environments they're in and what they react to that the external like stimuli um the rules mm. that they have to play against um that kind of thing yeah yeah it's funny like <laughs> what what uh what happens when i guess the people don't find the source of uh government power uh legitimate <laughs> did you have uh Akasa, oh, i can't remember why can i not pronounce the man's name asakaze and how he acts in the first episode but it's it's interesting how that how that kind of changes in some ways uh that will be interesting to think about i think yeah. um, why he why he rebels so much against this one kind of set up, right? The student council, uh, strict rules or whatever. And then there still seems to be uh, like the, the, I don't know. It, I guess it's more collaborative, uh, in episode two. And he's like, seems like way more chill and actually willing to help out the group. But the, the last thing I'll say before we move on to the next question, this is a random thought, but I just wanted to say it is that, uh, the show made me think that, it made me remember, I guess, that how important setting is mm. because in episode one, you know, when I'm learning about the premise, I'm thinking, man, this is, uh, you know, a little Danganronpa-ish. <laughs> Why? Because they're at the school. You know, it's Danganronpa, you know, is a more of a murder mystery thing, but it is very much kids trapped in a school and there's a bunch of weird rules imposed on them from without. I'm like, okay. Uh, it's, it's going for that kind of thing. Uh, but then when they go to an island, it's Lord of the Flies, isn't it? Mm. Why? Because Lord of the Flies takes place on an island. So it's, it is interesting how the setting can, I guess, influence, uh, what we compare a show to and how we think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just waiting to set up on a space station and running around in like, you know, these really multicolored suits and stabbing each other. I mean, if you what think it... if you think that joke is actually a bit out of place on this one, I'll point out that the another feature of this is that if they get injured, they heal over the course of a day. So essentially, you could treat every single day as a new round. I'm telling, I'm yes. telling you, it's a video game. It's battle royale, man. So, <laughs> some, some, someone's getting shoved out of that airlock. I'm telling you now, and it's probably going to be, it's probably going to be Janus Joe Sarahoshi who pushes the bell. Uh, yes, let's hope so. <laughs> All right, next. Next, indeed. Uh, so, next question from Rackham is, based on his power and the final scene of him using it in episode 3, do you think Hoshi, aka Starboy, or, I'll say it last time, Mr. Joe Star, uh, could end up presenting or introducing a religious element or authority into the show the same way it has depicted or introduced the idea of government and capitalism as well? The mm. uh, y yes, I mean... Apart from the fact that um, the, the the religious element could very well end up being the uh, what were they called in Berserk again? The chosen ones, because it is an eclipse after all that we see. The God hand. Yeah, it could be the God hand. I mean, we saw the eclipse in in the end of this. Don't tell me. <laughs> don't tell me it's not possible. Man, don't. It better not be that. It better nah. not be some <laughs> beat for beat <laughs> eclipse episode or whatever. No, I'd, I'd love it if it was just like a joke where. Um, Nagara just like opens up a door like as he's going through all these portals of course episode 3 and he just sees the god hand there chilling around a poker table and he just quietly closes again without nope. comment <laughs> nope no thanks yeah not dealing with that um it's the grandpa simpsons gif just I, I pick would, the hat back up and get out of there i, I would say it's certainly possible i mean the, the idea of savior like see has religious connotations to it depending on how you read it um, oh man yeah the god i didn't even think about this the, the eclipse as well like you know that sometimes mm -hmm. is seen as a religious event um, totally and i think that i would be interested to see how that pans out yeah um wow. because again while dancing around my talking point here one of the things that sunny boy has shown uh, in its episodes thus far is that even though we've had this kind of factory reset people are still settling into clicks like they're selling into like you know schemas of rules and expectations and demands and societal pressures and all that and 
therefore it would only be natural for one of those offshoots of this reset to zero but this inward like you know desire to fall back into this kind of order based system for a religion to come about because religions um from my perspective as a non-religious like godless heathen are that you know they have historically been created in some sense to oppose order on chaos now whether or not that chaos is something that is you know morally or ethically demands the order that religions place on it is up for debate on a per religion per moment etc so based i'm i'm speaking in very broad strokes here but nonetheless i think that's how i see them and i could certainly see that spinning out from here but i have a feeling though that if hoshi were to do that he would do that just merely as a kind of green worm tongue whispering in your ear thing to someone like maybe you should start a cult green worm tongue. start a cult <laughs> do it be fun be a laugh. Oh. Uh, slap a sakase. <laughs> Just God. do it. Um, wow, so this question is interesting because Rackham says the final scene of him using it. Um, now, what he could mean there is just passively, like using it to hear the the voice that is someone else speaking to him or it could mean like he like somehow like Hoshi is generating the voice which I feel like I don't know which one do you do you think he's I, I, hearing something else or do you think that's his own voice I, I feel it'd be a bit silly for him to be making his own voice like in his own head unless you're talking like split personality perhaps maybe um yeah but i i, well, I don't know um mm-hmm. well, i mean there's it, one here's the main reason i'm asking because like so in episode three it's very clear like at least it seems clear that he's like he's hearing it uh but there's a scene in episode one in which he's talking to someone else i don't remember who it is and like it doesn't show him talking, but it shows the other person's face. And you're meant to think, by the way, it's cut. This is Hoshi talking, but it's the same voice that shows up again in episode three, that really deep voice. It's clearly not his. And it's like, that's inserted into the conversation. And I can't, I haven't analyzed the conversation closely enough to, to where it like it's ambiguous like what, whether or not it's ambiguous, like everyone else heard it, or just how she's hearing, or what we're supposed to think, but it's like it just is inserted into the scene, and it's really hard to like, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to be disorienting, and then episode three is like, here's what's really going on. I don't. Well, we'll you know, hell if we'll, I know. we'll find out. Um, but <laughs> I I would like to see how it handles if they're like you know a religion does pop up. It can be a, a one episode thing, or even maybe a two episode thing where it does then die out. But we get to see its impact on the That'd um, be great. on the kids, you know, for example. Because after a while, you know, um, when I can't remember his name, he was the uh, he was the kid who actually figured everything out, came up with his own crypto, you know, invented the killer cloud of mouth space dogs. You right. Know. I don't know how to, but yeah, it's um, uh, Rajani. 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 Uh, yeah. Rajani. Uh, like you know, they, maybe they eventually get tired of him being the man of science, the man of reason and logic. Um, because his explanations right. don't ultimately, you know, get them home. And so mm-hmm. in the absent, you know, when science fails and if you feel so inclined, what is your alternative to fall back onto faith? Where, you know, where, where, no. where, where science and reason cannot save you, sometimes, you know, like you will call for a yeah. higher power. Right, right. It can can whip up a mob into a frenzy, that, mm-hmm. that whole thing. I mean, uh, yeah, so I didn't even think about this as an angle, but, like, I'm really excited about it now, Rackham. I hope it comes to pass because from what I've seen thus far, Sunny Boy uh, seems, like, pretty well equipped to, like, in, uh, in the span of a single episode, ask and provide some commentary on really classic political theoretical questions like religion's role in society and uh religion's place as something that like governs people versus like a private sort of thing you know uh i would be really excited to see it i mean i think if it does choose to tackle it it will almost certainly do a better job than 
brand new animal did. <laughs> well, that's not difficult. <laughs> that's not difficult. Man, the, the, that was, the, I was really hoping for some good stuff with like cults and shit, but it's not to be. I mean, I, the only thing I can say about cults with respect to DNA is it feels like it was written by one. Oh, a cult anime. Um, okay, next one, please. Certainly. Uh, so our next uh, batch of questions comes from Riku, uh, R-E underscore Oi. K-U. Not Riku as in Riku from Final Fantasy X. No. <laughs> Different spelling. Mm-hmm. What's well, shouts shouts to to Riku for asking questions? I believe they're a, a first time question. Yeah. Answer. Uh, so thank you very much, Riku, for joining us in this. Um, mm-hmm. So first one is Sunny Boy is quite heavy on allegory and clarity on the hows and whys of its events take um, takes a back seat by comparison. Do you think it will, or do you want it to, end up explaining the me- mechanics and physics of its fantastical elements? I think this is an in- this is an interesting one because I think there's inevitably a tension in a lot of stories like this between like explaining like how things work and being ambiguous because mm-hmm. the problem is that being overly mechanistic. We saw this with One Dragon how that actually even before mm. its ill-fated finale, like where it explained things, arguably too much to the point where it was clear like certain things hadn't been fought out like how it reflected on uh Momoe, for example like you know and uh, uh, and oh, i can't remember the name of her wonder egg uh the the trans girl but you oh, know right. you, 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 yeah you re- no i know who you mean yeah I know who you mean. yeah and how in theory the um uh, how in theory you know the mechanics of that like invalidated their identity as a woman uh which was a bad thing that like you know even if that was the intent by the writers or not, that is a bad thing as far as I'm concerned for the text of that work. But we've discussed that elsewhere, so I'll not belabor the point here. But rather, I'm using that to illustrate that there are pitfalls in overly explaining your mechanics of your story. Um, but the show has already dipped its toes in doing that by virtue of Rajani mm-hmm. um, being the man of science. And indeed, that is the entire crux, or one of the cruxes, of episode two, where people fall into suspicion and distrust rather than rational, you know, um, thinking and, you know, puzzling things out, finding out, you know, well, actually, is uh, is she responsible for, you know, burning the island? Uh, is she just being spiteful to us? You know, is Mizuo, like, you know, just being a fire starter, wicked fire starter, you know? Uh, is she doing that? So it's already dipped its toes a little bit into that, but that's a different from the show itself uh, going into explanations. You know, this is an in-character thing doing that, as opposed to the show being didactic or being overly expository. Um, I personally think that if this show were to want to strike a certain ratio of explanation versus ambiguity, it should aim, in my opinion, for being more ambiguous and focusing more on what its various, like, worlds, settings rules uh and characters powers of course do like i think to to boil it down i suppose um asakaze like you know the chap who can fly uh, i'm mm. more interested in what he does with the ability to fly rather than knowing how he does it and yeah. if we get to the end of this show and there is no explanation really given for how they end up here at all or if the explanation is just simply i did this ha ha um mm-hmm. say like you know it turns out oh she is actually the devil or something like that i'm i'm okay. <laughs> i'm perfectly <laughs> i mean yeah could, that, could, that could happen yeah. um sure i could see it yeah um i'm more interested in in the least in never this trust case, anyone who smiles so much ne- never trust anyone in who, an anime never trust anyone who has the joe star tattoo but doesn't actually is, but, it, but, yes. but 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 is it but isn't actually a jojo Unless, unless there's a strange way of pronouncing Hoshi along with what the saying is to make it like Jotaro Kujo. No, sorry, not even Jotaro. Like, uh, Gio- let's say Giotto. But you know, my, you get my point. So mm-hmm. I think that for me, I am more of the opinion that it should be ambiguous to a point. Not completely opaque, of course. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I do want to know like how it happened in the sense of like the event that triggered it, but not the mechanics behind it so much. And I'm much more interested. Where are in, they spatiotemporally? Yeah. yeah. And I, <laughs> yeah. and I am much more interested in the, um, in the effects rather than the cause. Cause I think mm-hmm. that's what the show is leaning towards. And I'll be fair, like thus far, like, even though like, you know, Rajani has obviously got into ex- like, has been pouring over like notes of what look like just like 
parallel worlds, stuff like he's drawn diagrams. Uh, he's got a complete map on his screen of like all the various portals and all that. Um, mm -hmm. The show has been relatively light on explanations and exposition, which has been uh, good in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that in turn serves it as a mystery show as well, because that's part of the this show's appeal. It is a puzzle that we solve along the way. But it's not necessarily a puzzle yeah. of where we have to understand everything, but rather just how do they get home? What do they have to do? Uh, and indeed, that's part of the appeal of, like, say, episode two. We're like, what is causing the burning? You're asking the question if Mizo is ca is causing it in the same way as the rest of them are, as the rest of the characters are. You might not have yeah. the same, like, you know, vested, oh my god, all my stuff's burning, like, you know, motivation to find out. But it is nonetheless an intriguing thing for you to think about. Totally. Um, I I think I always like err on the side of like well, what I care about most is like what the show is trying to say about you know people, the human condition, the world, um, and you know if it's like consistent uh, to a point anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. that's that's also a flexible notion if it's consistent with its own internal logic i mean i think that you know explanations like grand explanations for the hows and whys of mm -hmm. everything that's going on are sort of superfluous like yeah i would i would rather not like yeah waste time on you know a lot of that specific yeah. stuff i mean there's a way in which explaining it in a certain kind of manner could add to all that stuff could add to the the themes of the story could add to um you know the the mood and the political commentary and stuff but explanation for explanation's sake of like guys we really did think of how this could happen and let me tell you black holes I'm not really interested in that so much right i mean mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I I oh shoot, I was I thought of something to say, but it went away. So yeah, um, I don't really want it to, um, and I don't. It doesn't really seem like it will. Uh, at this point, at least not in the bad way. Um, mm -hmm. not not in the like, you know, we figured this out. Oh, and I should I should note, I don't mind if. The author of the show, if Shingo Natsume has worked all that shit out and there is an explanation for it scientifically or pseudo-scientifically, I'm good with that. That can exist. But like shoving that onto, onto us, I think, would not necessarily be in the story's best interest. Again, if it's done just for the sake of having an explanation. Yeah. Because like leaving things so open um is i don't know it's just fun like it adds to your participation as a reader of the text like you're constructing theories and you're making connections and everything and um and that can be a really valuable experience when yeah. engaging with media that stuff you're talking about there like i know where it's rightful places and it's on a wikipedia page so i'm cool with that <laughs> yes. too i'm cool with that yeah. too all right uh do you have anything else to add to that question doc nope Okay, next up uh, from Riku is, uh, what do you think the almost complete lack of music is doing? Why the choice? How does this contribute to the anime's themes or exploration? Well, the first, I think something to know, and this is something that a uh, YouTuber, Tanscrew, has uh, brought up in the past, particularly in relation to reality TV, is that music quite definitively can be used to set mood or inform emotional response. Uh but like you'll see, for example, differences in the music utilization as as on Tentacles um, video between reality TV shows in America and the UK, even though they are the exact same show, like Gordon Ramsay's show, where they'll always have like those shocking musical like tense tension building moments before Ramsay like lets rip with his usual profanity, whereas the music in the UK is less um, how prescriptive, like where it's not it's not basically telling you how to feel allows you to be more intelligent. Yeah. I'm basically saying that your TV is inferior to ours. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but. Point That's being, it. point being is I think that that actually serves again to help with the ambiguity here. Um, because yeah. if, you know, like, if, like, say you had that scene with, like, 
uh, Miso, like, you know, with her cats, and there's just sinister music playing over it, then that leads us to think, or rather infers us to think, oh, mm. she's she's mm-hmm. at fault for the blue fire. But, right. and conversely, you could have, like, much more relaxed music, which in turn would suggest she's not. It can inform mm-hmm. mood. So I think leaving music out of this is probably a wise idea for the most part. I'm not saying that there, it can't be done in this kind of show, but um, not being a, like, great music guy myself if that's the technical term um <laughs> that is great music guy yes or no. yeah um i'm not i'm not really sure like if that's um I, I don't really know myself how it could be done but i think thus far i'm in agreement that um or rather of the opinion that not having music in is probably for the best for maintaining the um for maintaining the mood in the we're just soaking in the environment we're soaking in what little noise there's like the waves for example we're not mm-hmm. being told how to feel. We're being left to interpret it on our own. Mm-hmm. Now, that being said, if things like, if actual events start escalating later on, um, you know, there start, starts to become like, say, cult stuff of outright mm-hmm. violence between people, or there's a climax, like, there's time and a place for music, I think. And if there was just them, like, completely absent, I'd be like, mm, could probably use something a little spicy up, but sometimes i think that it, it works in this case where it's just not there because it leaves it more to our interpretations to what's going on and just allows us to feel more like we're there with the characters to soak in the environment as presented rather than having background noise to accompany it if you know what i mean yeah i mean i think that's an astute point that the context of the show merits this choice and the only other thing i'll say is that um uh it's it's my time to talk about Dark Souls again. Oh gosh, because, <laughs> cause like it does this really awesome thing of having no music whatsoever when you're like out and about and exploring. Music only kicks in when you see that health bar on the bottom of the screen, and it's a boss, and then mm-hmm. you remember that music. And not only is it like the piece memorable to you, but like in that moment the emotional intensity you're feeling like goes up, you know, you start sweating a little bit, you grip the controller a little bit more hard because like, yeah. And uh, not an unrelated point from what you're saying about the mood, just like having, having a, a, such a kind of sparse use of music just makes the times that they do use it hit that much harder and feel that much more special. Absolutely. Um, And this is the point where I cite an anime example that I never thought I would, uh, but I often try to operate in, you know, credit where it's due. Let's talk about Shield Mm -hmm. Hero for a moment. Yeah, I'm really going there. Must we? We, No, seriously, right? This is a music-related thing, so just trust me on this. So there's a scene about two-thirds of the way through the show in which, um, without really going into great big dreams of context or spoilers, I mean, you can no more spoil Shield Hero than you can spoil a bucket of, like, mystery meat, to be honest, but that's a different point um there is like this giant orbital death laser that's about to hit like dao fumi and his gang um but in the build-up to that um like he he like basically like they're riding through the countryside and he says like stop and they're just looking around and all you can really hear is like the noise of the countryside there's no like tense music there's nothing mm. but you still feel tense because of the absence of it and, like something bad mm. is about to happen and what happens is pretty bad. Um, I mean, it's an orbital death laser, basically. <laughs> and just to point out as well, that show, like, again, for all of its terribleness, uh, it was scored by, uh, was it Kevin Penkin, who also did Made in Abyss, if I recall correctly? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, That's say, true. and hey, that, that was the only good bit of that show, to be quite... Well, okay, there were one or two other decent-ish moments Wait a minute. in isolation. Do you mean... Do you mean Shield Hero or yeah. Made in Abyss? Yeah, okay. no, that's, that's, no, the same. <laughs> You're like that was the only good part of Made in Abyss, and I was about to be like, "We, all right." No, I'm no, coming. no, no. I'm getting no, on no, a no. plane right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, but I mean, so if if you know if there was to be a tense sound background track for that, I mean, they had someone doing the score on it who absolutely could have delivered on that, but wisely. For what again? What it's mm-hmm. worth, given the content, it was like, no, this is a re- something really bad is about to happen, and rather than having like a or whatever, you know, it's just like complete silence, noise of the countryside, and then mm-hmm. pew, death laser, and it's a good moment. Like I, I shouted that out yeah. in the essay I did on it, like as actually a legitimately good moment for that show. But again, goes to point out that sometimes, like not using any music at all, is just as effective as actually putting a piece of original score in. 
See, I can be nice to shows that are otherwise terrible if they have things that are credit worthy. Don't say I'm not being fair. <laughs> Somebody left you a really good uh, YouTube comment on on that one. Uh, I like your face, of, even though uh, I don't. I was your face was not in that video. Your face was not in that video. <laughs> and that's why I say they said uh, it, just because they thought they'd be complimentary <laughs> to me about that. Uh, I don't even. It was a really. It was a long one, but basically, it was like, "Yes, you're correct," and I'll tell you why I also think Shield Hero is bad. Here's a, some paragraphs. So shouts to that person. Um, okay. It's always good to find uh, sane people in the wild. I know. Yes. Thank you, Riku. I would say your first question submission batch. A++. Mm. Excellent work. Indeed. Thank you very much. Um, so we have another question. This one's actually from Yukinon, who's asking on Riku's behalf, because uh, we normally have a two-question limit, but um, Yukinon wisely... Um, oh, creatively, <laughs> creatively interpreted the rules in a way that I absolutely approve of. Um, this, this is like the the show, like yeah, and uh, the in weird, arbitrary, in universe rules. It's it's fair, it's fair. Um, so the one question we have here uh, um, from you, Kidal, on Riku's behalf is: Is Sunny Boy saying that the inevitable or oppressive, sorry, the oppressive slash inequitable structures of society will always be reduced by those that are products of them, even in a vacuum? If yes, is it saying that there's no hope for change? And as a follow-up, how might Nozomi and Nagara's powers, direction, and travel be challenging this? Are they representing something allegorically? So I suppose now's a good time as for me to Ooh. drop my big talking point. Um, All right. Because this actually pretty much will address this. So I have a question for you, Doc. In stories like Law of the Flies or other similar ones where, um, you know, characters, relatively normal people are whisked away to a unknown scenario, um, what mm-hmm. generally speaking so is, is, isekais sorry, is what you're saying isekais <laughs> well I mean they're disastrous but they're usually just for the audience so anyway um, but what happens in these stories to the characters like if they're stranded on an island for example what tends to happen to these groups of people <laughs> usually they're like at some point uh, they descend into chaos and yes murder each other yes that's correct um that tends to be the standard for these kind of stories. But Sonny Boy actually argues, <laughs> curiously, the opposite. In the, I uh, Granted, part of this is because they don't really have a supply issue of food and such. But rather, what we see in this story is it's not a descent into chaos, but rather a descent of excessive order in a way that mm. almost feels um, authoritarian at times a little bit. Um, and again, that's because of the absence of like tension over like you know food supplies and all that. But it still seems to be a case where you know excessive rule uh, creation and adherence is uh, is a thing. That's the thesis of episode one, after all. Indeed, how it ultimately ends up doing itself. You know, we created these rules and ultimately we became bound by them. Um, but I want to note also various little moments in episode one that back this up. Um, Nozomi doesn't have a smartphone. And they insist on giving her one so she could be part of group conversations, but she has no desire to be part of that. She also then, of course, questions Cap's, like, you know, power or what they believe to be his power, saying, is that really your power? You know, that kind of thing. When it turns out it's not, it's a power invested in him by this state, government, body, whatever you want to call it. And then Whatever, it, yeah. This yeah. is just like the fabric of reality for yeah. all they know. Yeah. And and one of the other girls, I can't remember her name, but she mentions as an aside, I have exams when I get back, so I'm going to study. And mm. beyond, I mean, what how she comes to that certainty of coming back is up for debate. But how how odd and how interesting it is that that holds such power over her, that even despite being in this situation where there is no immediate suggestion they will ever get back, or if they indeed they do come back, they'll come back literally as they... you know, I mean, they are fundamentally changed as a result of this event happening, even if they literally slipped back the second they left, you know, and there was no mm-hmm. break in continuity, that she still feels compelled uh, to, like, consider that rather than more immediate concerns. Um, this reminds me a little bit of what I said about what was what, what I thought was going to be an interesting element of Diana Zenon, but it did do that, and I'm not going to drag on Diana Zenon because they had plenty of else going on, where... <laughs> um, Blue head boy, Yomogi, that was it. Uh, where he he yes. feels compelled to go to work rather than, you know, 
get help with Dinah Zenon fighting the kaiju, even though one is clearly much more desperate than the other, but like work has this kind of elastic bungee cord yeah. thing to it. And similarly here with the exams. So what I find really subversive and interesting about Sunny Boy, the thing I mentioned before, is the fact that it argues the opposite outcome to what you'd expect from these kinds of stories in the rather than a descent into chaos, it's an, a, a descent. And I'm not saying a sense here as an opposite. I'm saying a descent right. because it is a decline into order, excessive order at that. Um, mm-hmm. And the issue at the end of episode one, uh, that being, you know, the fact the school is being devoured by darkness still, and who knows what happens when that comes about, um, it is resolved through chaos and a little bit of anarchy. And I'm mm-hmm. not talking just about the fact that the kids basically, like, you know, don't believe in the rule of law anymore, and that deprives Cap of his power to, like, put penalties no. on, where, you know, yeah. where, where that happens. But I'm literally talking about the fact that, um, like, as... Um, Yuki and Riku rightly mentioned about uh, you know um, Nagara's and uh, Nozomi's powers about like you know direction and travel that well what proof do they have that this will work she's jumping into the black void it is an act of rebellion it could very well be her death and and as it turns out and there's a the moment where he tries to stop her um, but in the end like you know the, the fence that he holds on gives way um, so it's only again through like that, like even when he tries to bring her back, like she still breaks free from the because the rules so that's basis system here. I mean, again, we, there's no evidence that the void will necessarily kill him, but I think that if I were to literally look into a black abyss from my house, mm-hmm. I wouldn't necessarily go jumping in it. Let's put it that way, you know. But <laughs> that act of rebellion takes them to the next stage. So it actually, mm-hmm. so even though this is a story about a bunch of characters, uh, regular everyday people, school kids for that matter, you know, being transported with like a situation like you know where they're take away from society, you know, it doesn't descend into the eugenics shit that I mentioned from Guilty Crown or anything of this ilk. You know, it actually argues the opposite, but it doesn't then paint that as a good thing in turn. Going into excessive rules and excessive adherence to rules. Um, is no better in its own way. Granted, they're not killing each other or anything like that. And there is, of course, the facts that they do have, you know, like an unlimited supply of food and such. But, of course, there is still the fact that they need to solve this just for the sake of their sanity more than anything. Mm -hmm. But still, it makes the argument that there is a place for chaos and anarchy and rebellion in these kinds of stories. I think that's actually pretty genius. I like that a lot. Mm. Um, So, to answer Riku's question, like, if it I mean, there's also going to be mentioned in a little bit while I talk about episode two as well. Um, I still, however, think that, you know, like that's certainly a fascinating start for this show in that it doesn't say that it's going to go the way of Law of the Flies, but rather the opposite, but that's still not a good thing. Um, it's interesting, you know, talking about Nozomi's leap of faith. Like, it's interesting that in a show that is seemingly like just has so much to say about um systems and organizations um that this individual act like totally changed their society like completely because it looks so different on the island than it did in the school like there was a tremendous amount of discord uh and things were really breaking down uh in in the school like uh cap was you know illegitimately using force uh you know given to him by vote and consensus but like at at an earlier period like the people were starting to question the legitimacy of of the power and it was really all going to hell and then like you said almost a chaotic kind of action like an individual actor based on like her own individual will and impulses yeah took that leap and like flipped the chessboard and now on this island everyone seems to be more close they have problems to be sure but like there seems to be much more uh collaboration and not a lot of like kicking against some sort of order that was imposed on them that people think is illegitimate yeah i mean just to go back to nozomi for a second like 
what is actually the big deal about her having a smartphone? They wanted to be part of the group chat. They wanted to be like, you know... Control. Const- yes, exactly. To constantly be receiving messages. It's basically the equivalent of, like, you know, how some governments have said, hey, we're going to put a, you know, we're going to test this messaging system. It's for emergency purposes only, but people were rightly like, no, we don't want any of this shit. It's, like, it's open to abuse, basically. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're not, like, starving. It's, I mean, this is what the arguments that the show makes for the fact that, you know, food and such are not really a concern um, because there is no real, like, pressure on her to be controlled in that way. Um, and indeed, there's a little bit of that actually in a, in episode two as well with um, Nagara Nosa, like, hey, like, one of the other characters is like, why are those lot going surfing while we're building a fucking beach or something? But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, um, there's that. And then I suppose we should also address the idea of capitalism let's talk about our favorite you know like civilizational structure um (laughs) yes okay we could do that um yeah go ahead i i will (laughs) so so basically this again is another way in which the show makes good use of what otherwise would seem to be an impediment for these stories which is there is not a supply issue we have food we have water we're good the only actual threat that uh, an energy, but, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. The only actual threat that happens in episode two that, um, is that the island could potentially burn down. Um, like it's a the the scarce the only scarcity there is is of land, and of course, if the old place burns down, then they're done for. But otherwise, mm-hmm. they're fine as far as and in theory, they could also just retreat back to the school. I suppose. I mean, that's not an immediately said to be yeah. impossible. But yeah, any- they they can go back, and uh, they definitely can. And Raj also. They this was a nugget that was dropped very early and they haven't come back to yet. But this could be a possible future threat, Shadon, as Raj observed, like, is the school sinking? Yep. Because like well, he looked out to the foundations and were like, were those ever that shallow before? You know what I mean? So there's some question of, as to like is, is there some kind of time limit that they're working with? Yeah. And so the like Nazomi like she uh, sorry, not Nazomi. Um Mizuho, <clears throat> sorry, yes. So Mizuho, though, like, she has the power to basically get whatever she wants supply. She has a castle. It is literally yes. the Magic Kingdom. She is Disney. There we go. There's the there's the thing. Um, but rather, like, it... I think what it, reveal, like, it reveals is actually kind of interesting because it turns out all along, the obvious answer is, well, just give people stuff and just explicitly say that. Like, that's mm-hmm. not a big deal for, like, coping with the rules of this world. I mean, we have one character who steals something and then it just kind of burns up later and all that. But again, it, it seems to be triggered more at the moment of realization when that thing has been taken or no longer should belong to them when it originally side with them. Um, but um, then, of course, they have the introduction of uh, what is not Dogecoin, whatever it's called, basically. Uh, uh, let me find it. Um, keep talking and I'll, uh, yeah, I'll find it. They, they have the introduction of this, like, you know... Uh, you coin. Well, that's the one, yeah. They have the introduction of that of that currency as a means of like facilitating exchanges. But again, one must ask: currency is given out as a means of like dealing with scarcity. Like you know, there isn't, and if there was infinite food in the world, one would hopefully assume that we just give it out mm-hmm. for free. But we don't give it out for free because it's not infinite, and that's yeah. of course why you know when there are food shortages, uh, prices rise. You know, that's how that works regressively. Because we live in capitalist society. Yay, go capitalism. Um, But they don't have a supply problem. And yet, again, talking about the idea of the elastic, uh, you know, tension of like falling back into rules-based systems, all that they needed to do basically, and one I suppose could argue that relying on Mizo for this would be problematic because she's one person with all the power and that could in theory make her a dictator or an autocrat. Um, But still... In an ideal world, she would just simply, you know, be asked, "Hey, can I have like no you know, supply problem? Yeah, can I can you I have, have like a... A... Yeah. sorry, you finish? Can I'm sorry, finish it, your it, someone someone <laughs> just man- message her and say, "Hey, can I have like a cup ramen or something like that?" And she goes, "Yeah, sure, here you go." Um, yeah, we have we, a we, we have a private property problem. Yeah, we we not a uh, not a supply problem. Yeah, we we unfortunately snap back to fault the systems that we already know, even yeah. though the answer is like so obvious it's actually kind of brilliant because it's so true also of real life i mean to give an example and this is true for both the us and the uk um there are my understanding of it is at least last last checks there are more empty residential properties 
in both the US and the UK than there are homeless people. I know, I know. It's so, maddening. so what's the answer to homelessness then? Well, we just give them away, but we can't do that in a capitalist society. But the they answer again jobs. is homeless. Yeah, and that and that is again why I do actually think, even though like in a lesser story, the infinite supply uh, thing would be a detriment to it because then there's no tension over scarcity, resources, starvation, first, you name it. Um, this is still making a point that oh, um, you know we keep falling back into these ways, but the solution is right there for us. And so to go to um, one particular part of the question here, which is, is it saying there's no hope for change? Well, I think that, I think we'll have to see how the show plays out. Um, But the fact that the solution is there and is addressed and is brought up and is just as simple as it is, it doesn't require some like random ritual or some other like in show nonsense like it is literally as sensible and as common sense as hey uh this is yours go nuts um then i think that let's go and go back to that example i mentioned about like you know the idea of providing um you know housing for the homeless the solution is there we just need to act on it uh, on our will but we'll have to see how the show plays out to see if it will ultimately address that because it also reminds me a little bit of what's happening in another show i'm watching on kakeki shoujo where, without again going into massive reams of detail, um, we have like individuals versus systems. And the problem you then run into, of course, is that sometimes if it was so easy to dismantle a system, we'd have done it already. And that's what you run into when you write stories like this, where, oh, we could just do that, but it really isn't that simple. So we'll we'll see. But I at least appreciate, like, you know, the, the show's being basically subversive and and reverse engineering like previously established tropes in this kind of story where okay yeah there isn't a supply problem but that doesn't solve the problems it just brings new ones into focus and allows us Mm -hmm. to reflect on our own society where there is a scarcity issue of sorts i suppose depending on what you're talking about um but yeah i'm I'm thoroughly impressed with this kind of stuff in sunny boy like it's Mm -hmm. certainly not conventional but i think that makes it more interesting to think about yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I love the change of focus from, like, I mean, nothing, you know, no no shade throwing here at, like, uh, Lord of the Flies kinds of stories that are about resource scarcity. Um, but it is really cool to see, like, the the notion of, uh, was it, is Proudhon, uh, famous anarchist that said property is theft. And this is, like, kind of a distillation of that idea that like there's infinite supply of stuff you know but like (laughs) the fact that like people have laid claim to it and certain people have laid claim to a huge massive pile of it means that like other people uh are are left wanting uh, Mm -hmm. in some way or another that's that's the big issue and that's why they have to make this economy because like you know some a person is sitting on a bunch of the resources and people want them and for whatever reason uh on on this island that they're on in episodes two and three if there's not an equitable exchange uh, of goods or services then whatever you get burns in the blue fire so yeah. very very interesting all right i'm gonna try to answer these questions i just have um, one I don't... other quick point okay. to make that i think is really cool sure. if you like mm-hmm. um god miso sorry yes miso like she sends money raining down from the sky uh which <laughs> yes. then sets on fire yeah. but what's bri- what's brilliant about this and actually kind of like satirical even is again it's if people are running to grab it like they would do of course if you started like mm-hmm. throwing it's like it's like watching the end of, of tim burns batman the joke is throwing money yes, around yes. yeah and even though it's the joker doing it everyone's like no nah, I, want, I want the money you know but mm-hmm. first first point of course is that money doesn't mean shit on this island you know yeah i mean the the, the u.s dollar is backed by the fucking you know federal reserve that sure as shit don't exist there. and I'm, I'm sure the equivalent applies to the yen uh but i mean in a more literal sense like if you have like everyone has like fifty thousand yen or whatever it is in there how do you dictate the price then for something it, like you know money know. is worth money is worthless when everyone has tons of it basically um again another fog like capitalism is designed for there to be a poor and 
you know so in yeah. a way like apart from it just being nozomi like uh, sorry uh, apart from it being like um oh god sunburn mizuho. brain no way mizuho <laughs> apart from me apart from mizuho like you know uh doing it just a spider run it also just goes to show like that you know even when there is literally infinite money for people it cannot work inside this system and ultimately you know is meaningless like they arguably got more worth out of it burning just to provide them with a little bit of warmth so another nice little touch there i know there's like that's there's such a cool push and pull of like the kids um trying to start their own thing and being you know different from or independent from other kind of organizations societies collaborations and then them being chained down by kind of what they what they know yeah what they know is capitalism what they know is like authoritarian top-down uh rule and yeah so that's a really interesting okay it it is it is a bit depressing that you know like the youth the people you think would be the most imaginative still fall back to the old ways but yeah i mean well this is maybe this is like commentary about like a society or whatever it's particular, oh, I, I guess, I, I, are we emerging? Are, are we because... all? Are we all emerging from the well here? Going, ha! Ah, very interesting. <laughs> you look. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not that guy. But like, uh, but I guess just saying, like, look how indoctrinated these kids are. Mm-hmm. That's not their own fault because they're kids. You know what I mean? Um, like morally, they're culpable for choices they make or whatever. But like the fact that they can only envision a certain kind of world, like. I think adults do a lot of like the people that came before us, people in government now, the people teaching us, the people giving us examples when we were kids, like they shape our imaginations for that shit. And, you know, I think maybe part of what Sonny Boy is saying is like this generation's imagination has been limited uh, yeah. in a, in a re- very real way. Like they can only kind of imagine perpetuating what has come before um maybe that's part of what they're saying and it's early i think this is a big theme i think we can move away from that so like i'll get into trying to answer uh yeah sorry for uh, subsidy oh it's okay uh i'll get into trying to answer riku riku's questions via yukinon um so is the show saying that inequitable structures will always be reproduced um even in a vacuum by those that are a product of them. So what I what I said just now would seem to say like, yes. But I don't know if the show is saying that that's the way it always has to be. Like, I think it's early on for the kids. Perhaps as time goes by and they see the way that, you know, their society is working or not working the way that the rules of the various different this worlds uh, interact with that. Like maybe that'll kind of show them that they need to move in a different direction. I think a lot of it will go back to like what the author believes about human nature. Mm -hmm. Um, A very fundamental way in terms of at, at bottom, are people naturally like good and are only kind of corrupted by their environment or are we naturally like selfish and cruel and only kind to each other because of societal constraints? And mm-hmm. go, going back to what I said about like the different political theories, I mean, you know, if you wanted to read the pessimistic kind of accounts, you would look at, you'd read like Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. It's a very classic example of someone who's like, hey, here's how society formed from like the state of nature, he calls it, of, you know, of nothing to society and you know he takes a pretty dim view of what's at the bottom of of our hearts uh as as human beings but people like rousseau people like john rawls think like well you know all the bad stuff we do is a product of like what's been pushed onto us by our environment and what we've learned but like if that all went away in a very real sense and we were all equal but had the, you know, with the same kind of potentials, like then we would, we would help each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's an, I don't know. I don't know what Shingo Natsume like thinks about that. Um, up to this point, 
I think most of the evidence we have points to like him believing and the show saying that inequitable structures seem as as you uh, you Freudian slipped earlier inevitable <laughs> inequitable seems inevitable um, <laughs> but I'm uh, but I'm but I'm hoping you know I'm hoping that like so so to get into some of my broader thoughts about the show not to do with these questions it seems like each of the rules revealed in the show also kind of like in addition to their political ramifications and the sociological experiments that they are like seem to like help different characters kind of solve personal problems. And I, I guess what I'm hoping that the show does is like have these kids start to unlearn what they have been taught, like what they've inherited mm-hmm. politically speaking in terms of theory and craft something new. Uh, so I think that even if at this point it looks like the show is saying these things are just endemic to human beings, I see glimmers of that the show is saying that there is hope for change. Yeah. Um, and and something yeah. to note, of course, is that the the actual, even though they haven't escaped yet, I mean, it's obviously nowhere close to the end of the show. Even if they do end up escaping, that's still up for debate whether they do or not. What we need right. to know, of course, is that there are moments of genuine kindness in here, like the Gara finding um, Mizo's cat, for example, bringing her back mm-hmm. safely despite the fire. And then Mizo herself and the Gara, like, you know, going to help the people in um, episode three who are trapped behind the black curtain of, um, how to put it, it's like erasure, if you want to call it that, or just plain yeah. indifference. Um, yeah. And that seems, and you know, the, the progress like in the, of moving from one place to another seems to be tied a little bit to that you know, breaking out of the mold in one form or another is the way in which progression happens. So it's probably not mm-hmm. as bleak as, as you might think. And I I would argue, I suppose, if, you know, the show does end up asserting in the end that we can't escape, like, you know, going back to these existing societal structures that aren't good for us, if at least there is still the potential for, you know, moments of empathy and kindness mm. and, you know, that that's maybe it's not so bad. I mean, that's still something. The alternative is completely nihilistic. And I'm at least glad, right. you know, like we have these things in here, like to say that it's not like that. So I'm, you know, I'm I'm on board with that. By the way, just, we also need to just to quickly address the follow-up here, which is Nozomi and the yeah. Gara's powers of direction mm-hmm. and travel. Um, I think with respect to Nozomi, we need to find out at some point, I know I talked about mechanics before, and this is one thing I would like it to clarify. Is the direction something she chooses... Oh, that's uh, interesting. Or is it something that has been set out for her to find? Like, is it is it the case that she shines a light on the path, or is she more of a trailblazer, if you know what I mean? Right. So, based on what I can remember, uh, it would seem that she is able to see it. So her power is called compass, right? Rather than, like, machete. Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So she's, she's not, like, cutting a path through. Maybe she's, like she's seeing what's there in a way that other people cannot. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but one uh, that, again, of course, then ties into the difference between uh, falling back in line uh, versus, um, you know, charting your own path and coming up with something new. And, in, and I'm saying that, though, like maybe that could be something that happens later in the show where she breaks free of the compass and just gets to choose where they go next. Maybe that's how they break out. Because hmm. 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 this this whole experience seems rather structured in a way that makes me think that, well, who put the rules in? I mean, again, talking about mechanics, I'm not really so interested in the reams and reams of details of whatever deity or entity made this place. What molecules but are these? <laughs> but, but, but I'm curious about the, if it exists at all or if it's just something else. Um, and what their intent in structuring in such a way is like, you know, I've led you down this path all this time to get, you know, I've sent you in circles and all this, and maybe then there's always like, well, actually, maybe my compass isn't what's important. Maybe what is important is uh, I, you know, me choosing my own path, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I'm not quite yet sure. I haven't yet pieced together why Nagara needs to necessarily be involved in this from a narrative standpoint. Um Right. Right. Because it seemed to me like she was pretty willing to make the journey. It just turned out that mm-hmm. he 
mechanically speaking, had to be there to get her to the end point, even though she was, of course, the one who made the jump. Um, yeah. Although, although one He's can, finding of course, all the portals now. One can, of course, point out that Megara's like opening moments is him lying down. He seems very lazy, very unmotivated, and mm-hmm. yet he, ironically, his ability to travel is what defines him. <laughs> that is so, an interesting irony, isn't it? A yes, there's irony. Some, something to note that perhaps, and maybe yeah. it speaks, and maybe that speaks more broadly to a message of, hey, you, Mister Unmotivated, watching at home, you know, like you don't really want to do anything. You're just lazy or, I don't know, burn out, whatever you want to call it. Like, you have no. the power to, like, shape worlds and all that. <laughs> like, Maybe it's, could... like, more more charitable. Like, uh, look at how you've ground down, you know, systems of the world. Like, look at how you've ground down this kid uh, who, in a different context, has the potential to discover completely True. new universes. Quite right. Quite right. So, who knows? That's a more like, charitable but... reading. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I mean... There is potential, nonetheless, uh, for things to go in interesting ways. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of this. Um, I mean, I think that's... I mean, we're actually ended the Patreon questions now, but just mm-hmm. to skip ahead very slightly to my overall thoughts uh, without mm-hmm. going into too much detail. Like, I think I could at least say that about Sunny Boy, which is I want to see where things go next. Totally. I mean, I'm I'm on... on uh, pins and needles is not the wrong... That's not the right analogy i'm i anticipate the next episode greatly i'm i'm excitedly <laughs> waiting uh for, you, uh, you 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 it was, what's that line like it might be for goodfellas i'm not sure or something where it goes like you uh, you you had my curiosity now you have my attention that kind of thing mm, right yes sunny boy definitely has my attention i'm i am really fascinated by everything happening and i wish i had i wish i could think of like a a substantive answer to the follow-up from Yuki and, and Raccoon, like how might the the powers of direction and travel be challenging the idea of of uh, in, inequalities of structure being inevitable. Um, yeah, I wish I had a more substantive answer other than like, you know, hey, like kids have the ability and potential to do anything and come up with you know the the passion and energy of youth as like the mm-hmm. the vigor and the potential to like discover and create like incredible new things that the older generation couldn't have envisioned and like you know and yet <laughs> we're still like taking orders from the student council i guess <laughs> oh um, god well so. i mean i mean you know, depending on what uh, show you're watching, that's uh, not taking orders. Not taking the orders of the student council is punishable by death and being yelled at yes. by a very, very loud and angry <laughs> proto-fascist uh, who also has a BDSM power up. Yeah, I'm referring to Killer Kill here. Of that rules. Yeah, uh, that's great. Mm-hmm. I right. Well, that's the end of our Patreon questions, anyway. So thank you to everyone who submitted those. Um, yeah, I'm looking Thank forward to you. seeing where this goes, the show goes, and also seeing what more questions we get. So I appreciate everyone sure. chipping those in. So thank you very much, Raku, Riku, and you can help. Yes, excellent questions. And if anyone out there listening wants to submit, head on over to patreon.com slash Desho and sign up at the $2 tier. That will give you the Discord privileges to access the Sunny Boy channel. And then you can hop in there um, and ask us questions. Indeed. Right, uh, so we're now on to uh, final yeah. talk about I only really have one left at the moment uh, that I feel concretely happy about putting out there. And I want to talk about episode three and the kids who end up getting, like, how to put this, like, shunned into non-existence, basically. Because mm-hmm. there's a very, I think there's a very key thing that happens with one of them that distinguishes this is not... Um, because they themselves chose to be this way necessarily, but rather it is an external um, force acting on them in the mm-hmm. rule of the of the third episode's world. Yeah, um, Namco Bandai is the yeah. external force putting them in there for live streaming Pac-Man. <laughs> well, well, but that but that is exactly it. You've nailed it, Doc. One of them is live streaming, mm-hmm. and here's the thing, right? Okay, it might be Pac-Man, and I can't recall the last time I've ever heard of Pac-Man being streamed. Well, that's. <laughs> it's been uh, a while. 
I, I, but that being said, I also, of course, completely sympathize with the kid for wanting to stream and being like, I don't have anyone watching. Like, that's happened to me a couple of times. But the point being, mm-hmm. nonetheless, yeah. is that there is an outreach happening here. Now, whether or not no one's watching because no one cares or because that's blocked by the world is irrelevant. But nonetheless, this is not a case of I am being totally introvert. Like, this one kid out of these, of these lot here wants to reach out. Now... That, to me, makes it clear that this is not a case of they have brought this fate on themselves, but rather they have been ostracized or shunned by society to the point where people don't even remember what their names are. That kind of thing. Right, yeah. Um, so, so, and that's kind of, like, led them to them being erased. And that, I think, also, like, is quite a powerful thing that points out that, hey, uh, you know... Mm. Um, pay attention to the people around you like uh, i'm not saying everyone needs to be on first name basis with everyone else of course but you know when you're in a small environment like that it might help to make sure to pay a little bit of attention to them but conversely of course some of them seem very happy inside of these environments but still insist like part again of the rules based orders they must be dragged out you know uh like what yeah. and there's and no concrete reason is given for them doing that like oh you know we want them to work and all that i'm like so what what are you working towards? Like, your goal should be finding an exit. Building, like, beach or something seems a bit daft, especially given one of the people you've sent on the oh, investigation man. can actually just build <laughs> shit for you by clicking her fingers. <laughs> this is such a good point because everyone... I mean, this is like the fucking hamster wheel of capitalism, right? Like, every, everyone is... R- rather than collaborating on what they need to do to make their life better, like... Everyone wants shit from the vending machines. And so Pretty they build much. the fence for half a day to get their like sports drinks and candy yeah. bars or whatever. <laughs> their fast yeah. food buckets. So um, so I like I like the nuance and the symp- and the sympathy this gives towards this these bunch of characters. It'd be very easy to just make them be, you know, I don't like anyone, I hate everyone I talk to, you're all terrible, you're all shit, blah 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 blah. That kind of thing. But no. rather they're just hey, I like doing my own thing. Um, and again, the reason that they are one, like that they tried to, that the group wants them out of there is not justified by empathy, but rather they try to justify as like, we want them out to work. But even then that is shown to be like, you know, a know. facile reason. Um, so it's, so it's, it's well nuanced. And I like that they just add that one Man. little touch in of here's this person who's trying to live stream. They do want to engage, but they want to do so on their terms. It's so it's such a good point by you because it's th- these you know these frozen people I think they call them like they don't it doesn't happen until episode three like they're on the island during episode two mm-hmm. but once they set up the currency and like the economy becomes such an important part of their life that's when those people become alienated because. They're not interested in getting that shit necessarily, at least not through work. And then you don't want to work. And like the other people who want to participate in that hamster wheel just don't have time for them. And so like, it's like a double, like they don't want to be there. And then the other people, it doesn't matter if they leave because they don't care. So yeah, they're just, they're pushed out and alienated by, you know, the like all pervasive uh, what is it? Uh, the all pervasive Hyoryu coin, mm-hmm. and uh, trying to to get a bunch yeah. of shit from the vending machines. <laughs> yeah, um, or or maybe more get a bunch of more Tanuki suits. And it's just because the from and, in, and in the end, the Garo like you know actually talks them a little bit, and, like helps them out in the end, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it's it's a nice little bit of nuance there, where it's not simply just okay. These people sh- should be forced out of their cliques. Like you know, no, yeah. they're in they're mm-hmm. in, they're in the places they want to be. There's no mm-hmm. justifiable reason given to force them out of it on, except on their own terms, of course. So yeah, a uh, good shit to Sunny Boy for making that very good shit. Po- making that point. Yeah, it's not critical of them as individuals, which I really really like, and I think that that theme was was started in episode two and. Here's the thing I was going to say is that I think episode two is a really great story about how people uh, really, really want to blame individuals for systemic problems. Like, it's so easy, right? Someone just has to be like, 
Oh, it was them. Did you did you know hear about it? Did you did you hear how it was their fault? This and this. And then that just catches fire and everyone without really any kind of evidence apart from hearsay is like, "Hey Mizuo, we know that you're burning all of our shit and you need to stop or something really bad's going to happen to you." There's like people like stalking her, throwing shit through her windows, like threatening her, like all because they think this individual is to blame for this clearly systemic problem that was, it seems like it was so easy for Raj to figure out. You know, like you, you, just, know you know, what's the punk it you, know what, you know, what's just struck me? Mm. Um, they are more interested in punishing Mizuo for burning things or supposedly burning things rather than just from her excessive, overly excessive wealth and material right. resources yeah. Yeah, like yeah, you know yeah. pe- people will not criticize the rich be that monetarily rich or materially rich for the fact they have that in of themselves when they could be sharing out of us they will need something else even something made of complete fiction to point that out yeah. to, to go to have to go for them like you burned my shit now i'm mad because <laughs> yeah, it affects me it, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly it's it's crazy so yeah um kudos to the show for this for also not being i should say in anything we've really discussed being overly didactic about it overly like you know preachy i mean there is that discussion yeah. between mizo and nagaro about capsules but it's brief and it's to the point and it works um there isn't any like real screening it's just it's subtle it works in my opinion yeah the 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 wrong person <laughs> gets to win the wrong argument gets to win just because she's you know mm-hmm. aggressive like, yeah. you know, she's just like, hey, we live in a capitalist society, dude. That's how it is in the real world. It's like, look around. <laughs> like, yeah, this is not that world. And it doesn't have to be, you know, we yeah. can, it can be something else. But like, they're so wed to these um, indoctrinated yeah. ideals and ways and, of moving through the world. And last thing I'll say is, again, just to point out, like, how this show is doing things differently than you might expect. There's plenty of stories out there about rich people suddenly losing all of their wealth or the ability to exercise their wealth. You can see it, for example, happening maybe in some post-apocalypse stories. You got this like rich executive, like, you know, stranded and can't call anyone, his money's meaningless, blah blah blah. He's completely powerless. But what we have here is the opposite, where we have Mizuo, for example, gaining the power of wealth and material resources and infinitum. And the thing is, like, mm-hmm. I something I should note as well, um, just with everything I've discussed about the idea of infinite resources in this show. At a certain point, there isn't a distinction to be made, in my opinion, be- when it comes to supply of something people need, between it being infinite and it being more enough to cater to everybody. That, to me, feels like it, as long as it is replenished, which in this case in the show it absolutely is, there is no difference. And of course, in turn, that applies to the example I said about homelessness and, you know, like supply of housing. Do we have infinite housing available? We don't, of course, but we have enough to cater for everybody. So what really is the difference? It's a semantic one, I would argue, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and that's similarly, yeah. and that's why in turn it works, in my opinion, in the show, because even though they do have infinite resources, at a certain point, supply becomes so immense that it doesn't matter that, you know, so it, that's why that works, in my opinion, rather than it being a detriment as it would be in a lesser written story, so kudos overall to the show, like, you know, I mean, on my first watch through for all this, like, I, I caught some bits of this here and there. But I have to admit, like, its obtuseness kind of caught me a little bit off guard. But that, again, mm-hmm. is not the show's fault. You have to take it on its own, you know, like, on its own terms, basically. Um, and I think that there is certainly um, a rewarding uh, element to it. And also just the fact that it's also non-conventional in how it approaches it, like I said, mm-hmm. it's worthwhile as well. Yeah, there's so many questions I have about, you know, like the show's relationship to technology. Um, because it just seems like magic. Oh, uh, a lot of the time. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm I'm, I'm yeah. laughing because I just want to quickly point out Arthur when we C. got to, when no. when we got to episode two and there was that mm-hmm. QR code, I thought I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna scan it with my phone and it didn't do anything. And I'm no. like, that's such a missed opportunity. It didn't How need to be it anything. Not take you to the website. It should have been a fake app for those coins. It should have made a point of like people, like you know, where you can just like start trading these coins. That's all you can do, and you're like, well, what the fuck's the point of this? You go, oh right, that is the point. There is no point to this made up currency. Good done so much yeah. for that. It'd been great. Damn it, damn it, Sonny boy. 
you had an opportunity there, but never mind, I guess. <laughs> admittedly, admit, I mean, I haven't seen anything on social media to suggest that that's the case either. Like, you know, that there was a QR code and made my phone broke. But I'm just thinking, like, wouldn't that have been so cool if you did been, that? That would that, have, been, that'd have been baller. But Yeah, baller anyway, for sure. I am all talk town talking points, so I'll pass the baton mm. over to you, Doc, if anything else to add. I mostly covered everything, but I do have a question. If you think... What do you think the relationship is between, if there is a relationship at all, between the different uh, rules imposed on the group? So I'll just give you my interpretation of each of the rules for you and the audience here as a, as a refresher. So in episode one, the school, um, it's that rules uh, are coercively enforced, like like. The power, whoever majority imbues with power can coercively enforce the rules that they come up with. Rule of um, law, yeah. Yeah, but like uh, but democratic sort of elected rule of law. Like people say you have the power and then you have the power. Uh, and you have the legitimate use of force. Uh, and then on the island, in episode two, we've said that items acquired unfairly burn up and... Uh, exchanges require, um, you know, uh, a bartering requires a, an equitable exchange. Uh, the third one on the island, it seems like that, like, you can, people can kind of, like, alienate themselves, like, think themselves into isolation. Um, mm-hmm. They are alienated from society, from the world, and they can go into their shell and it's like a physical like a real shell right so like do you think that there's any core theme or progression or any kind of relationship johnny rackham says the qr code is real yeah i i it must have stopped work i think they've mentioned in because um we've had a reddit thread post on our discord about this just now so thank you for the point that there rackham where mm-hmm. it mentions you have to reverse the colors or something like that i am um, but the fact that actually works is amazing i'm so glad that that is i'm gonna have to find out what it is later yes. um yeah. to go to go back to your question i think we're going through different strata of um of layers of rules and societal like requirements so we have like the absolute base which is the rule of law that's the baseline which is mm-hmm. Do people, like, you know, believe in, like, figures of authority? Because that's true of whatever economic system you're in. Like, if you're talking about communism, for example, uh, that still, you know, that still applies. You have to believe in the authority figures there. It's this, and even then going back to, like, you know, the time of kings and all that, like, the divine right of kings. And all, again, that is the investment of the rule of law. So that's your first layer. And stacked on top of that is your economic system, of course, as we talked about. And then it's your social system there. So I think that these are increasing layers of the same thing. And that as they're drilling through these worlds, they're going up this like tower of like what layers society is built on. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's my suggestion. That's my suggestion anyway, because like yeah. you can't, I mean, you can't have uh, an economic system with firstly without, of course, the rule of law to enforce it. But then so much of our social system and social rules are dependent on an economic system uh, that in turn, I don't think it could exist without one because, you you know, people want stuff and how do you get stuff from other people? Um, that dictates your social interaction by virtue of just your basic needs. So yeah. I, I don't think the link between those last two is necessarily directly strong because the economic problem is not really something that affects the, uh, the characters in episode three that have been... Um, you know, take into the behind the curtain rooms. But that being said, they are in turn like, you know, being demanded to be pulled out from it because they want them to work. So maybe that in turn is the economic link there. But I think that these are right. kind of like a, I don't know what the, like, it's like the, uh, the Tower of Hanoi, like, you know, thing where mm-hmm. you have like, you know, these layers and you can't really pull out the bottom ones without all collapsing. So we'll yeah. see what it keeps yeah. drilling up towards as it goes through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I could be completely out of talking out of my ass that one, but that seems like a link that I can mm-hmm. come up with. Yeah, they, we're just uh, theory crafting. We're theory crafting. And yeah, yeah I'd say this, those kids in episode three, you know, are, I mean, they're just being dehumanized in, in a way because what suddenly has become like the measure of your value and worth is uh this is this fucking currency or really the work that you put in to get it uh right uh just like you know now like people might hear that 
someone doesn't work or just collects a, I don't know, a disability check or welfare or whatever. And, you know, certain all, older people for sure, but people with a certain kind of mindset would think less of you because you don't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're like a lesser person because uh, you're not contributing to society or whatever, despite the fact that there's so many other ways to contribute to society yeah. than fucking be at some corporation. <laughs> Than having, like, than, ha- I mean? than, ha- like, than having the value of your labor of rich exploited. People? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh God. But like, uh, but yeah, that's, I think that's a good, uh, a good working theory. I had a similar thought was just that like the, sh- that the show was like presenting different, either forms of government or pieces of government or institutions, like power structures, right? Throwing them at the kids and be like, like your reality, you know, it's it's baked into the metaphysics of the world that like, you know, these dudes decide the rules and if you break them, they can magically punish you. Or, you know, if you don't exchange, uh, have an equal exchange of goods or services, like the thing that you got through exploitation will burn up. And like, how do you respond to those scenarios? Like, mm-hmm. um, is, and, and I think... Some of the responses have been good and some of them have been bad. Uh, mm-hmm. the, like the way that they responded to uh, the the kind of uh, law and order, you know, baseball bat to hand uh, government um, of episode one seemed to, seemed to be a good thing. You know, this individual act of rebellion that created totally new conditions for a different kind of society to to form and flourish but then what happened with episode two like how they reacted to this rule of equitable exchange um seemed to be a very bad reaction (laughs) like introducing like a a layer of of currency just seemed and and it's bad because it's now created this culture that alienates people. I mean, I think that like, it's an objectively bad thing that those people mm. got, you know, like thought themselves into isolation, yep. you know, and other people right. are like, is that a disease? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Wow. Or they were fought into isolation by them, but it depends on like who's responsible. Mm. But yeah. I'm of, yeah, I'm, of sure. the, I'm, of, I'm of the opinion. It's probably more likely to have been that, mm. you know, the the uh, society around them mm-hmm. but yeah um i've got nothing more to add really uh it's yeah, yeah. just That's damn interesting fine, to think about damn fine show damn fine show so now we're gonna rate and review this damn fine show um oh boy um right well i'll go first then i yeah i i'm not sure if i can necessarily criticize like I don't think the show really has any failings as far apart from the perhaps the fact that and I admit this might just be me and the fact that my brain has been like you know flambéed into like you know a little, <laughs> into a stew for my yes. own folly but I, yes. I think the problem is like some of the characters feel a little indistinct from each other it feels like that mm, they mm-hmm. just kind of blend together um, yeah, and that makes I think that makes following what's going on a little more difficult than it needs to be. Like I think because I think that when it comes to writing, there is an intended level of ambiguity or impenetrability when it comes to the text versus what actually happens. You know, we talk about all four real yeah. intent, you know, for example, and actual execution. And I think that Sunny Boy does intend to be like you know a show that demands a lot of its audience. But there are still ways in which you know, like I think that it makes things a little bit tricky for us to fall along that shouldn't be there like again the fact the characters feel a bit here and there like Nagaro for example like I, I, so much I, of it yeah. is very vague <laughs> yeah like Nagaro I'm just like he, he's a dude you know and again uh, this is all <laughs> this yeah. this is all very much intention like you know as I said before with not wanting to give too much backstory to them but I, I mean there needs to be a little bit more development to, think, to make the show feel engaging I, as well because I could see a lot hmm. of people being turned off um, yeah. And I'm not saying this needs to become like a dinosaur on where it is about the characters expressly, um, because I think this is more a conceptual show. But mm-hmm. it still, to me, feels like you know I'm struggling to remember who the heck various people are. Um, but nonetheless, I find it intriguing. I think it looks great. 
Uh, it's certainly not lacking for visual flair, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm intrigued by its philosophy. I'm intrigued by its um, the way in which it's doing things and that it's not, again, starting from high order to chaos, like, but rather it's showing that descent into order itself is a problem, which is an unusual message, but a welcome one nonetheless. Um, I hope that eventually it becomes more pointed and hopefully a bit more positive, how should we put it, like optimistic in its critique of the systems it's looking at and that maybe they can be overcome in some way or another, or even it's just maybe little individual victories are still worthwhile because otherwise it might get a little nihilistic. Um, so yeah, I am overall pretty positive on this show. Um, I'm probably in the end going to give it uh, 4.25 out of 5 um, killer clowns from outer space dogs because literally they look like dogs made out of balloons like in that film <laughs> um, so yeah 4.25 out of 5 in the end uh, it could be a little bit I say it could be a little bit more engaging on the character front I think uh, without being detrimental to its overall mm. abstract and conceptual nature um, but still overall a solid start and I, I admire shows like this as well I should say that are un how should we say like unaccommodating and unrepentantly themselves like i'm yeah. here to be the way i am so to be the show that i want to be i'm not trying to accommodate people who aren't interested i'm not trying to like you know throw in random shit like fan service for example where it's not justified um you know i i'm here it's and always justified yeah um <laughs> so yeah i'm glad for that and hopefully like, I'm curious as to where it goes next, but again, I'm hoping it delivers more on exam- its examinations and its subversions rather than being interested in mecha- mechanics. So, uh, mm. fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. Let's see how we go. <laughs> yeah. You, do you just feel like you've been burned lately so you don't want to get your hopes up? <laughs> oh, you did not just <laughs> say that! You know what's happened to me over this weekend, you bastard. I'm sorry, while well, I was saying that, I didn't think I'm of the I'm j- until I was just you saying, reacted. Yeah, I have been burned so badly <laughs> I can't think straight. I, the sun is a deadly laser, as they say. Oh, for fuck's sake. I can't believe you. No. That was incredible. You did that with Ivan realizing. <laughs> Pun not intended. Uh, the answer to that is yes, I have been burned by anime as of late. Uh, again, thinking of Wonder Egg, so sure god yeah let's hope this is more of a um oh my god why can't i never remember the name of this fucking show you know that we covered uh after uh Izokin. uh that would be decadence wouldn't it yes let's hope it's more of a decadence than a than a wonder egg uh, well, well, neither of them ended. Neither of them like ended. No, as well as but one started, is but clearly the better drop, than the other. Yeah, one one had a much sharper drop off in quality. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, looking yeah, looking forward to what comes next. To it. Um, anyway, over to you, Doc. You gotta give your uh, gotta give a rating. Um, well, it's funny how ratings are because it sounds like you're giving it four and a quarter, like trending down, whereas I, I'm also giving it four and a quarter stars. Um, or rather, four and a quarter, um, oh, I don't know, shattered smartphones out of five, like, to trending up, because, you know, I think that the show, like you said, it's just so um, unafraid uh, to be what it is and say what it needs to say, what it wants to say in the way it wants to say it. Um, it just is very distinctive. And I love its ideas so much. Like this is very much a like my speed kind of show. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's not really any huge flaws. I mean, for me, um, I guess, you know, like you said, I could see how other people <laughs> watch uh, Kageki Shoujo, uh, says Yukinan. Um, what dudes, where is Kageki Shoujo streaming? Uh, it is on Funimation. Okay, well, maybe maybe I will watch it. Maybe it I will. Kid, maybe I will. Is it kid friendly? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, well, that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna that's go with no I mean. because I'm gonna go with no because basically uh, it has seen it, well content warning for a show we're not even talking about on the podcast, but it, uh, eating disorders, um, child oh, abuse. Oh. <laughs> um, but thankfully, the, these scenes are very much in moderation. Uh, they're not excessive. They're not gr- like you know, yeah, 
exploitative. They have a very, very clear um, narrative purpose. But mm -hmm. yeah, content warnings do exist and with good reason, like Yaki Shoujo. Um, <laughs> okay, fair, fair. So wait, wait till after the kids are in bed to watch this one. Uh, good, okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so back to Sunny Boy. Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, all the other things uh, people could perceive as faults, I mean, I just think like are, are really are things that turn me on are things that are appealing about the show. Uh, I love its, uh, abstract obtuse nature. Uh, I love, you know, the, the writing and the, like I said, the ideas, um, the visuals, uh, the, the sound design. But I guess, I mean, I'm saying I love everything about it. Why is it not five stars? Well, you know, like you said, um, th there's, um, I think I said similar words about parts of uh, Girls Last Tour is that like, um, there's like, an, uh, it's intellectually just candy, but like there's a certain emotional punch it doesn't quite have yet. Um, yeah. So it doesn't, it's, it's not like there's necessarily something wrong with what it's trying to do it's more like it doesn't rise to the level yeah there are there are shows that both can be an, in, can yeah. an intellectual and emotional feast and sunny boy is not really emotionally driven by design so i can't mm -hmm. fault it for that but i mean you know i can't also then say like yeah. you know it's as emotionally engaging because it isn't by designs as others which i would find overall races better anime so there you go yeah, I mean, it's just not to say I'm not interested in the characters. I mean, I I like them all. Like, it's just not the shows. Like the like the show just doesn't. Uh, like it's not its strength, and it doesn't like push up the overall quality again to make the show rise to the level of something else. But, but that's not to say that like you know. I, I mean, if it keeps up the level that it's that it's at quality wise, like with the writing and everything else it's doing, I mean. I could end up rating the show even higher because that consistency over time is definitely meritorious. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. I mean, I, I'm still waiting for the God to turn up. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Just don't, don't wish that into being, uh, don't wish that into being. Okay. Well, folks, we did it. Um, stream of thought. We have covered episodes one through three of sunny boy um that's our show um next week is we we begin the second stream this this will be a stream that patreon viewers we're will the be able to have access to right away what's that we're, get, we're getting the beast running we're hailing a ride yep yep yeah that's right <laughs> uh the next two weeks we're going to be doing patron streams uh podcasts they'll come out eventually for free but if, if you want to get on those now then head on over to patreon.com slash show and subscribe at the appropriate tier level shadon uh remind me and the people which ones that we are covering for which weeks so next week we will be covering odd taxi uh, a show that I feel like with the benefit of hindsight, we probably should have <laughs> covered when it was airy, but well, what, are you, what can you do? Nobody knew when it was just starting, right? It didn't have a momentum behind it. It definitely like built up a cult following over time. Yeah, it's true. I, I, mean, I admittedly didn't even watch it while it was airing separately, but well, more fool me, I guess. Uh, so anyway, Odd Taxi is next week. Uh, the week after that will be Death Parade. Uh, oh, man. A, a show so that I know next to nothing about. I'm assuming there is death and there is a parade in it. That's my best guess. Uh, like, it's a show that I've been meaning to watch for so long, but I've not seen it. Um, mm -hmm. I love Death Billiards, the anime Mirai short from years ago that was a kind of precursor to Death Parade. And I've heard nothing but glowing reviews. Uh, uh, the late, you know, missed Zach Birchie. Uh, former editor at Anime News Network, wrote a really great review of Death Parade.